Hey guys, what's up? It's Vanna. Welcome back to another episode of My Thoughts Exactly. Now, as you can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about anxiety. We're talking about anxiety today. And when I posted this on the My Thoughts Exactly Instagram page, I was actually very surprised at the response. I don't know what response I was necessarily expecting, but I guess I was just very surprised about how many of you were very vocal in the fact that this was an episode that you were really looking forward to and excited about and that this was something that you struggled with a lot as well. And because of that, I made sure to take very good notes about what I want to talk about today because anxiety itself is a very generalized topic and I feel like there's a lot of, you know, little subsets and subdivisions that we could talk about within the whole concept of anxiety. So because of that, I decided to do a little research and I decided to go back on some of my old videos that I had posted like five years ago And I, because I knew I had posted several videos regarding anxiety and I wanted to see what I had to say back then. And okay, also side note, I was heavily surprised with how much or how little I should say I, you know, cared or gave a shit about what I was saying. I was just spit firing and ranting. Um, I watched those videos back and I was like, oh my God, I was very, very honest, but it was a good thing. It was good. And we're going to be honest again here today. Not much has changed, but I wanted to make sure that, or I wanted to see rather if there were any changes in how I felt back then in regards to my anxiety and how I feel today in regards to my anxiety. Now, I also asked you guys on Instagram, the My Thoughts Exactly Instagram, ways that you, you know, cope and deal with your anxiety. And I got a lot of responses that we're going to share more towards the end of the episode. But in the beginning of the episode, I want to just kind of run through a timeline and run through the different kinds and different types of anxiety that I have experienced in my life and where they came from, how I coped with it, and things like that. Because at the end of the day, the only person's experience that I can really speak to is myself. Because anxiety is something that is so different for every person, it's not really something that I can sit here and like lecture you on and like give you a definition and like, you know, run you through all like the psychological meanings behind everything, nor would you want that because, you know, you can go to school for that. But I'm not here to do that today. All I want to do today is kind of talk to you guys about my experience with anxiety. And then we're going to turn to you guys and you guys are going to talk about how you guys have coped and dealt with anxiety. So to jump just like right into it, I feel like I need to talk about where my anxiety has derived from for the past however long it's been. I honestly don't remember a time in my life where I didn't have anxiety. And the reason that I have always had anxiety and the reason that I get anxiety at any point is because I am in a situation where I feel like I lack control. I'm a control freak. I feel like I've told you guys about this. I am someone who thrives off of having control of every single situation in my life. I don't like things that are out of my control. I am not a spontaneous person. I don't like surprises. I like to know what's going on at all times. And if I feel like in my life or if I'm ever in a situation where I am out of control and I feel like I can't grasp what's going on in my life that's when my anxiety sets in. And for me, what that anxiety has looked like is a couple different things in terms of my physical responses to it and my physical reactions. The first is I get a giant, uncomfortable pit in my stomach that will not go away no matter what. Another one is I get really bad shortness of breath and I feel like my chest is compressed. And the third is overthinking. My mind will move at a million miles an hour. It will not stop moving. You can ask anyone who knows me, any one of my friends. I have always been told that I am the biggest overthinker that anyone has ever met. And I've always met people. I remember like several instances where they're like, you know, I always thought that I was like the biggest overthinker I knew until I met you. I don't know if they think that that's a compliment or not, but I just, I know that 
I, it's not a surprise either when they say it. It's definitely not a surprise. I know I overthink, but it's a result of my anxiety because I try to overthink every single scenario of what could possibly be happening when I'm in a situation where I feel is out of control. I don't like to not think of a certain scenario. That way, no matter what scenario has happened, I typically have already thought of it. And so it's not a surprise. Do you see where I'm going with that? So like I said, I've had anxiety for as long as I can remember. Those were the physical, you know, reactions that I get to anxiety, but I've also experienced a lot of different types of anxiety. I have experienced separation anxiety, social anxiety, you know, dating and relationship anxiety, abandonment anxiety. You know, I get anxiety over the health and well being of my friends and family to like an over concerning extent. And I know those aren't like, types of anxiety, like clinical types of anxiety, but those are the reasons that I get anxiety. And pretty much all of those that I just stated, I still have to this day. The earliest recollection that I have of having anxiety happened when I was really, really young. I had to have been four or five years old. Now you might be sitting there thinking, Svena, how does a four or five-year-old get anxiety? Well, I don't know, but I know that I had it because I remember being really, really young And I would be in like preschool or daycare or something. And I had really bad separation anxiety from my mom. And anytime I had to leave my mom or anytime she left me, I would get incredibly anxious. So much so that I remember there was this one specific weekend where my grandma came into town and was watching me and my brother. So my parents could go on like some trip or whatnot. And I freaked out and I was so anxious about her leaving. I never wanted to leave her side because I always felt that if I ever left her side, it could always be the last time that I would ever be with her, the last time I would ever see her, the last time she would ever see me, something like that. I always had a fear that something was going to go wrong. And so because of that, she ended up giving me like this little black box almost. And when you open the box, it had a picture of her and a voice recording. I don't think they do this anymore. You could just do it like on a voice memo on your phone. But at the time you would open the box and it would be a picture of her. And she was like, Savannah, I'm going to be back. I love you. Don't cry. And I would just play that over and over and over again. And that's the first time I remember having separation anxiety, but it only snowballed and got worse. Um, when I was in middle school, I had specifically fifth grade, I would cry every single day going to school. I was that kid. I would cry constantly at school for probably the first half of the day. And then by noon, I was fine. And I would go through the rest of the day and then I'd see my mom. But again, it was that separation anxiety thing. I had severe separation anxiety from being away from my mom specifically. I didn't, it like for, for whatever reason, it was just my mom. Like I didn't have that feeling when it came to my brother or my dad or like my other family members, my sisters, like none of that. It was specifically my mom. And going into school, I remember every single day for probably like the first six months of school, I would cry in fifth grade. I don't like, I know why, but again, I don't like know why, if that makes sense. Like my anxiety would just take over. And I remember every day when I would wake up, I would get this pit in my stomach, my chest would tighten and my mind would just race. And this was obviously something that my parents did not know what to do or how to deal with. I can't blame them for that. So that's when my journey with therapy started. They put me in therapy because of it, because they didn't know what to do. Like this was not something that was, you know, typically normal. I spent a lot of time in the school counselor's office. I spent a lot of time in therapy trying to figure out what exactly it was that made me so anxious. And when it came down to it, most people, you know, the people that I would talk to, the professionals were just like, you know, she has anxiety. She has separation anxiety. But in that circumstance, there really wasn't much that my parents could do because obviously I have to go to school. Um, You know, I remember begging my mom to let me be homeschooled because I just, I never wanted to leave her side. That's how bad this was. And so it was the worst in middle school, fifth grade. Then after that, I remember going into eighth grade and this is where my social anxiety really kicked in. I had horrible, horrible social anxiety. I remember I was friends with, you know, my school is very clicky. I went to an all girl school in eighth grade and I was friends with the, you know, popular girls at school and I could not have been any more 
awkward if I had tried. I remember every single day at lunch, I would go and sit at these tables with them and I wouldn't say a word. I would literally sit there in complete silence and just listen to everyone talk, listen to everything. I wouldn't contribute. I wouldn't say anything almost because like I felt like I couldn't. It was weird. I almost felt mute. I was like, the words were trying to come out, but nothing was happening. Like my mouth wasn't moving. Sound was not coming out. It just, the words weren't happening. And I remember feeling so uncomfortable and really wondering why no one else had this problem. Like, why is everyone sitting here talking and they're fine and, you know, they're all friendly and I'm sitting here and I'm awkward and I feel uncomfortable and I'm not saying anything because I don't want to say the wrong thing and I don't want to be looked at as weird. And so I'm just going to sit here and say nothing because somehow in my mind that made everything better and made everything make more sense. And so over time, you know, I left that friend group and went and found friends that I was comfortable around and friends that I was able to speak around. Um, and I didn't feel that really awkward anxiousness, um, because I've always just had this social anxiety about saying the wrong thing in front of people. And if I say the wrong thing in front of someone, are they going to look at me funny? And are they going to say something weird? And are they going to care? And like, I've always, even to this day, I would say I'm very socially awkward unless I feel extremely comfortable around you. Um, And I, I will say, I feel like I've gotten better with it over the past like two years. I feel like you know, as I've branched out and moved to a different state and made new friends and things like that, it kind of forces you to get out of your bubble a little bit. And I feel like that's exactly what I've done. But I can recall so many times where I've been put in situations where I feel like the elephant in the room, if that makes sense. Like I just feel, you know, not in like size or whatnot, but I'm just talking about like, I feel like the elephant in the room because, you know, the elephant in the room is something that everyone kind of like tiptoes around and everyone's like, what the, like, are we going to say something about this? Or like, is this weird? And I felt like the elephant. I felt like I wasn't talking and I didn't know what to say. And, you know, I was just uncomfortable and my anxiety would take over. And literally it felt like my anxiety was just like, like, clipping on my vocal cords and not letting me talk. So I just felt like I was the elephant in the room and it was hard. It was really, really hard, especially, you know, in high school, I went to four different high schools and I remember in the second high school I went to, it was a very, very big Catholic school. I wanted to go there. I thought that I was going to have some like Lizzie McGuire, like Cinderella story experience, But it was horrible. It was really, really bad. Um, I know a lot of people loved it, but it was just not the right fit for me for someone who has a lot of social anxiety. It was very, very difficult. I ended up, I don't know if I've ever said this on camera. I remember I would eat lunch in the bathroom every single day that I was there. I was only there for a semester, but throughout that semester, I ate lunch in the bathroom every day because eating lunch in the bathroom by myself in a controlled environment felt safer to me than going out in public with a bunch of people I don't know, again, feeling like the elephant in the room. And that was just really hard. It was a hard experience to go through. And I carried those habits throughout, you know, the next school that I went to. And then by the fourth school, I broke that habit because I ended up making a friend and, you know, we really got along and I didn't feel like I needed to eat lunch in the bathroom anymore. But that's what I'm saying. It just, it consumed my life to, and it still sometimes does, consumes my life to a point where I feel that when I have no control, I need to do whatever I can to feel like I can gain that control again. So that was like the social anxiety aspect of it. And then you move on from that. I have also had really, really bad dating and relationship anxiety. And I feel like a lot of that comes from a fear of like, It's like anxiousness over abandonment. We're really getting into like the therapy session today, aren't we? But like I just have had, I remember the past two years specifically, pretty much ever since my last breakup, I have had extreme anxiousness. Well, no, that's not true. I would say ever since I was 16, I've had extreme anxiousness 
over dating and relationships due to a fear of abandonment because I can't control another person. Does that make sense? So like my anxiety with dating and relationships does not come from the fact of like, I'm anxious to go on a date or I'm anxious to have a boyfriend or I'm anxious to get into a relationship. It's simply because I can't control what another person does or what another person thinks. And so I try to get like one step ahead of the game always. And I'm like, you know, in my head, I'm like thinking, you know, three years down the line of like, okay, these are all of the things that could happen. Every single one. These are all of the ways that he can ghost me. These are all the ways that he can break up with me. These are all the things that he could say that are going to make me mad. These are all the fights we're going to get in. And I do that because again, like I mentioned in the beginning, it's my way of controlling the situation and it's my way of controlling my anxiety. Because if I can prepare myself for the worst case scenario, then there's nothing to be anxious about because I'm already pretty much prepared. Does that make sense? That's just the way I've thought about it. And again, like I mentioned earlier, a big, big physical reaction I've had to this, I don't know if it's physical, it's probably mental, is my overthinking. I've had an overthinking problem for years, but it only comes out typically when it comes to relationships because of my anxiousness surrounding abandonment. Now, You can ask pretty much all of my friends. There was a very big period of time um, where my overthinking would definitely get the best of me. I was looking through old texts the other day because I was trying to find this picture that I had sent my friend. And there are very few friends that I confide in like this. However, it was very eye-opening to see. I don't want to say it was very like, you know, disturbing or scary or sad or whatever, but like it was very eye-opening because I realized how much I, first of all, how much I have evolved since that point, because I'm not like that anymore, but how much I let this anxiety and overthinking consume my life. I would text my friends, you know, all of the things that I was going to say in response to someone, or should I call him now? Should I call him tomorrow? You know, he said this, should I say that? Was this too mean? Was this too nice? I don't know. Am I being too soft? Am I being too vulnerable? Is he never going to talk to me again? Did I come off like a bitch? Like it was never ending. And because of this anxiety that I had surrounding, you know, abandonment, I definitely put up with a lot of bullshit that I shouldn't have. And I definitely lowered my standards to a degree that I, you know, looking back at it now, because like I've said, I've evolved a lot since then. I lowered my standards to a point where I would quite literally slap myself in the face if that were to happen again. Like it was very eye-opening to see, to see how much my anxiety controlled my life. It was kind of a double-edged sword in a way, because I felt like, you know, in order to not let my anxiety control my life, I need to in turn try to control every other facet of my life that is uncontrollable. That way the anxiety won't control me. But in reality, what I was preventing was exactly what happened because I wasn't able to just, you know, sit back and be like, I'm not going to let this affect me. I'm not going to let this control me. You know, whatever happens, happens. And like, you know, take it day by day type of thing. I'm not that person. I've never been that person. But over time, I've been able to kind of pinpoint a couple different things that have helped me, which I'm going to get to. Um, Pinpoint a couple different things that have helped me in regards to how I approach these feelings of anxiety. Because I admitted this five years ago. And I still think that, you know, what I said was true. I was being very honest at the time, but for a long time, I would turn to alcohol and I felt like when I was getting drunk, I had no anxiety because that's what alcohol does. It makes you feel, you know, really light and fun for a couple hours and then you wake up with a, you know, hangover by death and it's horrible. But at the time I would get really drunk and one of two things would happen. I would either one forget my anxiety and forget what I was anxious about. And I would, you know, be light and airy and fun and happy and bubbly. And oh my God, like life is great. Or I would then take all of the feelings, all of the anxiety, everything that I was overthinking about and everything that I was just like pushing, 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 pushing down, it would all come back up. 
And it would all come back up, but not a nice way. It would all come up in a way that was so out of control. And then I would have to do damage control. And that's even worse. So there were one of two ways that that would go about. And again, it was a very unhealthy outlet. And I know a lot of people do that. I know a lot of people, you know, they turn to alcohol because it's just easier. It's the easy way out. You know, it's right there. And I could just, you know, have a glass of wine and take the edge off. Like, you know, the saying, take the edge off. It's like you're taking the edge off of the stress or your life or the anxiety or whatever it is that you just kind of want to like, you know, not deal with for the moment. And for a long time for me, that was alcohol. And honestly, for me, that changed Fairly recently, I would say, sooner than I would like to admit, I think that my, you know, coping mechanism with alcohol really changed probably within the past year, maybe a year and a half, something like that. And I have learned a lot of healthier ways of coping and a lot of healthier ways that work for me. Um, but also a lot of different, you know, reminders that I tell myself when I get those feelings of anxiety. So to just like touch back on that timeline for a second right now, I told you, so I had really bad, you know, relationship, dating, abandonment, anxiety, because I'm now in a relationship in a healthy and happy relationship, is my mind going to let me just, you know, like chill a little bit and like not have anxiety for once in my life? No, of course not. Because why, why, why would we do that? Why would it do that? So the dating relationship abandonment anxiety that I once had has now transpired into anxiety about the well-being and health of myself, my family members, my loved ones, you know, everyone in my life, always worrying that, you know, something bad is going to happen or the other shoe is going to drop. That's kind of my anxiety now because, you know, obviously I don't have relationship anxiety anymore, so it's got to be something. Um, So yeah, that's definitely something that I have been struggling with. It's something that I have definitely, you know, talked to my therapist about and we're working on it. But, you know, I think that a big part of that, again, is just the control factor. It's something that I can't control. I can't control, you know, everything in the world. I can control if God forbid something bad happens typically, usually. And that is just another thing that I've had to come to terms with. And, you know, I haven't felt that way in a while, but when thinking about this episode and how I wanted to craft it and talk to you guys about this, which was last night, I was really, you know, trying to put the pieces of this episode together. It was the first time in a really long time that I felt that anxiety again. And it kind of lasted until this morning. I remember I woke up this morning and I was like, why can I not breathe? (laughs) Like it just was a very intense feeling that I luckily haven't felt in a while. However, When feeling it again, I was reminded of, you know, how good it was not to really have it for a minute, just a minute. It was a minute of calmness, but that is the timeline of my anxiety journey. So I've had anxiety for forever. I also want to say that I have been clinically diagnosed with an anxiety disorder. I forget what it was. It was like five years ago. I have all the paperwork for it and the brain scans and all of that. But I think it's also important to recognize that regardless if someone has a medical, you know, clinical diagnosis or not, that doesn't mean that their feelings are any less valid. What I've seen happen, you know, too many times is people being like, well, how do you know you have anxiety? Like, what does that feel like for you? Like, how do you know that? And at the end of the day, it's no one's fucking business. Like, I'm sorry to like, sorry, but it's just, you know, how you feel is how you feel. And if you have anxiety, you know what I'm talking about. If you're listening to me right now and you relate to what I'm feeling, or maybe, you know, it feels a little bit different for you, but you know when you have anxiety. And this is not something that like, it's like fun to have. It's not like a cool trend. And that's also another thing I feel like, you know, in today's, day and age and today's you know this the world that we live in right now it's very easy to throw these words around you know anxiety depression like they get thrown around a lot in my opinion a little bit too much because when they get thrown around so much it almost you know it discredits those who actually have it um not saying that every single person in the world doesn't have anxiety i'm just saying that you know sometimes there's a difference between stress and anxiety. And if you know what I mean, you know what I mean. Not discrediting anyone's feelings, but I feel like you guys understand what I'm saying. You guys, you guys get it. And what's funny is for the longest time, I really never thought that anxiety was something that, 
you know, only certain people dealt with and only certain people lived with. I remember I kind of just felt like for a really long time that this was something that was normal and this was something that everyone dealt with, so to speak. But then I remember I have this one friend who has always really been like my voice of reason in everything in my life. And I remember having a conversation with her about like, I don't know, like two years ago or something. We were both living in San Diego at the time. And I was explaining to her my situation and I was like, do you ever just get like anxiety where it's like, you know, it's just like this tightening in your chest and you just feel like you can't breathe. Like I'm just like freaking, I was like freaking out. It was just really bad anxiety that day. And she was like, honestly, no. And I was like, what do you mean? Honestly, no. And she was like, I just, I don't feel anxiety. I don't get anxiety. And like my jaw almost hit the floor because I was like, I've never met someone that doesn't have anxiety. And like, I envy people. And I think anyone who has anxiety can kind of relate to this. You envy people who don't feel like that because this is not like a fun feeling, you know, to feel like your stomach is about to fall out of your body and to feel like your chest is tightening up and is going to explode. Like, this is not something that's fun, but it was just very interesting to see someone who doesn't have that anxiety and doesn't feel those things. And I remember she said, you know, I just live each day, like every day, like each day is a new day. I take things as it comes and, you know, whatever happens is going to happen. So there's no, you know, sense in worrying about it. And I just, in my head, when she said that, I saw two polar opposite ends of the spectrum. I saw someone who, you know, doesn't have anxiety, takes everything as it comes, you know, one day at a time, like whatever's going to happen is going to happen. And then I saw on the other side, me, who's like a, you know, control freak and is not, I'm not in the mood for whatever happens is going to happen. And, you know, take each day as it comes like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to figure out what's going on here. Like, that's how I, that's how I figure it out. And not that it makes me feel any better either at the end of the day, like my anxiety and my overthinking, it doesn't, you know, it, in the moment, it feels like it's helping because I'm like thinking of every single scenario and thinking of all these things that could go wrong. But in hindsight, I'm really only damaging myself more and damaging my mentality because not only am I only thinking in the negatives and expecting the worst, I'm exhausting myself with all of these alternate possibilities when in reality, you know, all the overthinking that I did in that time ends up really being for nothing because all of the scenarios that I play out of my head, more often than not, they never happened, never. So it's just, it's not worth it, but I can't seem to stop. So there's that. So before we get into what things I do, like, you know, physically to help me with anxiety, there are things that I tell myself mentally that have really helped me. And one of those was something that my therapist actually told me about. And I remember it was about a year ago when I was going through like my big, you know, relationship, dating, anxiety, whatever. And I would always tell her all of the things that I figured would happen and all of the, like the worst case scenarios and all the overthinking and everything. I would always explain these things to her. And it's a quote that you guys have probably heard, but it's, you know, she explained it in a different way. That thing, it's like, well, what if it doesn't work out? And then someone's like, well, what if it does? And her whole standpoint on it is you need to accept that you deserve good things in life, in all facets of life, in career, friendship, family, romantic relationships, like you deserve good things in life. And just because a good thing is happening is not because a bad thing is going to follow it. A good thing can happen without anything bad happening. And that really opened up my eyes because now when I think of what like worst case scenarios and bad things happening, I remind myself like, okay, I deserve good things. And I'm typically feeling anxious because something feels good and something in my life feels like it's going right. And I'm afraid there's going to be another shoe that's going to drop. And this whole mindset of, you know, I deserve good things to happen in my life. And just because something good is happening doesn't mean that something bad is going to follow it has like impacted me so greatly and helped me so much. I remember last night specifically, like again, talking about this whole episode and whatnot, it made me anxious and it got me thinking about all these different things. And I reminded myself, I'm like looking for something to be anxious about. And I think that a lot of people are guilty of this just because, you know, a lot of us have been subjected to situations where we felt like something was really good and then we get the rug pulled out from underneath us. And I feel like it's a very natural and normal feeling to kind of be like, whoa, 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 
I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. When in reality, it's okay to believe that you deserve good things. For a long time, I felt like that made me conceited and prideful and, you know, egotistical and big headed and all of these things because it's like, well, I deserve good things. And it's like, no one wants to say that. But at the end of the day, if you really sit with yourself, it's all about self-love and self-acceptance and understanding what you deserve. And again, I know that a couple episodes back, we kind of talked about something similar with just accepting that you are someone who deserves good things to happen to you in life. And also understanding that because of that, because you are someone who is deserving of all of the good things that life has to offer, that no matter what happens, no matter how it plays out, it's going to be in your favor either way. Even though, let's say, you don't get what you want automatically, it doesn't mean that it never will be. You know how they say like rejection is redirection? Like that's true in all facets of life. Jobs, schools, colleges, you know, romantic relationships, friendships. Like if you don't get into the school you want, like, or, you know, your top college, your top choice, your top career, top job, something like that, you know, another one is going to come along and you're going to understand why it didn't work out with the first one. Same thing with relationships, same thing with friendships. It all falls into that category. And so just understanding that even though there are, you know, bad things that happen in the world, there are bad things that happen in life and that is inevitable. And that's something that can't really be fixed and can't be controlled. And if you're like me, You hate that fact because I want to control everything and I want to make sure that everyone is good at all times. I want to make sure that everything is good at all times. I'm not Superman. I can't do that. And unfortunately, neither can you. And it's a scary feeling, but there's also some sort of relief that comes into just acceptance of what's going to happen. And that's something that I've really tried to get myself to do this, you know, past year or whatnot is just allowing what's going to happen to happen because I can overthink until I'm blue in the face. I can, you know, make up all of these fake scenarios, all of these, you know, this is going to happen. That's going to happen. You know, did he say this? Does he like me? Does he not? Is he going to leave me? You know, am I going to get the job? Am I not? There's so many things that could happen, but regardless of how much I overthink or not, it's not going to make any difference. It really won't. And just allowing what's going to happen to happen and trusting the process that it's going to lead you in the direction that you deserve to be in because you deserve good things. That's the mindset that I encourage you to start, you know, implicating into your life. So hopefully that makes sense. I know that that was kind of a ramble. That was a lot of words that were thrown together. And hopefully that's something that you guys feel like you can start doing. And it just takes a little bit of faith. That's all it takes. And trust me, I know it sucks. If if like anyone can understand like how much it sucks to just trust the process, it's me. Like I get it. But what are you going to do? Like genuinely, what are you going to do? So just understand that, you know, when it comes to the anxiety, find the root of it, find where it derives from for you. And, you know, there are things that can help cope with anxiety. And for me, in terms of a physical sense, what I do physically when I have anxiety, there's a couple different things. Now, for whatever reason, when I have anxiety, I like to be surrounded by people because it shows me that there's other things going on in the world. So for me personally, what I like to do, a couple different things. First thing I like to do, I like to go for a walk because I like to get outside. I like to get fresh air. I like to see other people driving by, see other people in their houses. It reminds me that there's other things going on in the world and that the problem that I'm dealing with at the moment seems a lot bigger in my head than it actually is. Like in the grand scheme of things, there's so many things going on around you in life. And a lot of times I think it's easy to just kind of like seclude ourselves and just like kind of sit in our little anxiety bubble and to try and deal with it ourselves because like we think we can do it and it's going to be fine. It's just easier to sit here and get swallowed into it. But I personally have found that when I get myself out and I see other people, I don't need to talk to them because I don't want to do that. But when I see them, you know, out and about doing their own thing, it again, just puts things into perspective a little bit. And that's not, it's not like the same as like, you know, 
you fractured your finger, but somebody broke their arm. Like, I'm not saying it as like other people have bigger problems. What I'm saying is, you know, seeing people live their life on their day to day just helps me a little bit better in my head of being like, okay, you know, there's other things that are happening. Even though my world is revolving around this at this moment, look at everything else that's happening like around me, you know, or go get a cup of coffee, like go walk to the end of the block and back, you know, go do whatever it is that you have to do to kind of like, like escape yourself out of that mindset. I know you can't physically run from it, but just like, you know, get moving. I think that that's the biggest thing that helps me along with that. I also love to go on drives, going on drives with like a good playlist. Nothing beats going on a drive with a good playlist regardless of the mood you're in, you could be anxious or you could be happy. You know, if you have a good playlist and it's like the right vibe, nothing beats it because that's the biggest thing for me, especially as like a heavy overthinker, I need to get out of my head. So in order to get out of my head, I need to get out of the space that I'm in. And it really does help me. Um, along with that, the third one, which I know a lot of you said in your answers too, is going to the gym. Going to the gym has really helped me again, I see people, I see them moving and, you know, their lives are going and puts things into perspective for me. And then I also get to take the anxiousness that I have being pent up inside of me and let that out in a form of physical exercise that's good for my body and is releasing like, I forget what the happy chemical is in your brain, but whatever that is, dopamine, don't quote me on that, but I feel like that's what it is. It's like releasing the good chemical in your brain and it's making good things happen. And what I found about two years ago when I was heavy in this like overthinking, anxiety ridden stage, typically whenever I would go and like try to escape my anxiety, whether that was through a walk or a drive or the gym, whatever I was anxious about typically resolved itself within the time that I had started and ended whatever activity I decided to do to help my anxiety. That's just typically how it worked. But those are my suggestions. But now we're going to look at what you guys had to say about it. So again, I asked you guys on the My Thoughts Exactly Instagram what you thought So starting from the bottom, it says listening to calm music and doing yoga. That sounds very relaxing. I love that. Again, just like getting your body moving, doing physical activity, getting yourself in a calm mindset to remind yourself that everything is going to be okay, I think is always the way to go. I really like that one. Another one says listening to music, focusing on the moment in front of me and disassociating which is really what we had just spoken about, you know, reminding yourself of the moment that you're in, you know, you can't control the future and just reminding yourself to remain in the present and focus on what you can control in your life. Spending time with my daughter and watching her smile, journaling, music, baths. A lot of you mentioned that you really like journaling. I've actually, that's one of the things that my therapist has always recommended is journaling. I've never been able to actually get into it because it hurts my hand. It really does hurt my hand when I write. I think I have carpal tunnel or something like that. But I think that journaling can be very relaxing and therapeutic. I just can't focus on it being relaxing because my hand hurts. But if your hand doesn't hurt, I can imagine that that would be a very relaxing way to relieve that anxiety. Someone said, pretend everything is okay and then make a to-do list of all the things I need to get done. I think, okay, I know that's like probably not the, you know, recommended thing to do, but I think that that, if it works, it works, you know? If you just pretend that everything is okay, it's like a fake until you make it kind of mindset. And sometimes, sometimes that's just what you need to do to get through the day. You just gotta fake it. A lot of you said working out, again, writing in the gratitude journal, a lot of deep breathing exercises. I know someone like my brother who also experiences anxiety, you know, we handle it in a lot of different ways, but something that he does is a lot of deep breathing and meditation. I think everyone handles and copes differently and certain people like to be, you know, meditating and in silence and deep breathing. And I think if that works for you and that's relaxing, then that's amazing. Like, why would you change that? I think that that's perfect. For me personally, something that I've always struggled with, I don't like being in silence with my thoughts. I like being around people. I like seeing people. I like hearing people. I like hearing noises to block out the ones in my head. You know, it sounded darker than intended, but you guys get it. 
Someone said grabbing something really cold because it distracts your mind from anxiety. Okay, I actually have heard of this. I heard that, you know, washing your hands in cold water, a cold washcloth on your neck or chest, I think that feeling that sensation of the cold really, it, you know, it distracts you. It makes you think of like, oh shit, I'm cold rather than what's going on and what's, you know, causing that anxiety. Another one says, I'll sometimes just sleep it off or do a pick me up, you know, get Starbucks, shop, favorite food type of thing. And I love that. And that's something that I've done as well. You know, sometimes it's just like it takes getting out of the house and going and getting your favorite coffee or going to Target or something where it's like you're doing something for you and reminding yourself that everything is going to be okay. Going for a hike, hanging out with my dogs, taking deep breaths and cuddling with my dogs. Those are some of the other ones. And then the last one that I'll say is one that I really like. It's remind myself that I already made it this far. And again, I think that that's a very good mindset to have. I oftentimes think that, you know, little mantras that you can remind yourself during these times of severe anxiety and anxiety attacks and panic attacks and things like that is centering yourself in your mind and reminding yourself you already made it this far. You can do this again. Like you're not given any battle that you cannot handle. And I truly believe that. And that's something that I've had to remind myself too, is like when I feel like I can't do this, like I'm like, I literally can't do this anymore. I remind myself like how many times have I thought that throughout the course of my 25, almost 26 years of living lots, lots and lots. And you can, and you will. So that you guys is the anxiety episode. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts on everything. But with that being said, you guys, that's all for me today. Thanks for tuning into another episode of My Thoughts Exactly. I will be back next week with a brand new episode and I will see you there. Bye guys. Bye.